Is it just me or it seems like it's getting harder and harder to stay in shape these days, you know what I mean? I don't know if it's knee surgeries or arthritis or eating wrong or not getting enough sleep. I don't know what the problem is, but you know, the British Empire and, and its colonies for, from the 1600s to the mid-1900s, they used to attach a ball and chain to prisoners to kind of limit their movement and keep them from escaping. And I don't know about you, but sometimes in life, sometimes, man, I feel like I got that ball and chain wrapped around me, limiting me physically and spiritually. You know, God knew that we we're all going to have emotions and experiences and fears, fear of death, fear of failure, hurts, emotions that would hinder our life of faith. Now, you were given on the way in a chain here to kind of symbolize as a reminder of a hurt or an emotion a sin that has you chained and feeling spiritually imprisoned. And so it was inspired by God, the author of Hebrews, penned these words, since we are surrounded by so many witnesses to our life of faith, we, we must get rid of everything that slows us down, especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around us and won't let go. Now, runners and swimmers prepare long and hard to build the endurance and, and the strength necessary to be successful in their respective sports. And by race day, their bodies are lean, they, their clothes are light so they can compete as fast as possible. The discipline necessary to be a successful athlete is the same discipline necessary for the follower of Jesus Christ to run the race of life well. And we've learned in our sermon series thus far that knowing the Word of God and studying the Word of God and reading the Word of God and applying the Word of God, as well as the role of prayer, those are very important in, in growing spiritual roots that go deep so that those roots can help us weather the storms of life that each and every one of us face from time to time. And because so many of us wrestle with sins and emotions and experiences and feelings and hurts that have a stronghold, I mean, they have a stronghold in our life controlling us in spite of our best intentions. Because we all have some of those, we're going to learn today the necessity and the importance of being rooted in restoration. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to uh, Romans chapter 7. We're going to look at some words that are probably very familiar to many of us, beginning with verse 15 of Romans 7. The apostle Paul writes, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree the law is good. So I'm not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature because I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. Now, I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind, and this power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you take out the outline there on the inside of your bulletins, 
We'll fill this out as we go along. Paul is describing in verses 15 through 24 the affliction of addiction. I don't know if you can relate to the frustration that Paul was expressing here in Romans chapter 7. Sometimes I have felt like, man, I, I, I could have been the one who wrote these very words. And because Paul wasn't specific about the sin or the sins that he was wrestling with, because Paul was expressing his helplessness over an unnamed condition, the reality is nearly every human being can relate to Paul's frustration regardless of what it is that controls us. In a letter to the Corinthian Christians, Paul wrote that he was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. And I don't know if the issue he was referring to in 2 Corinthians, if that's the same issue that he's referring to here in our text, but it's interesting to me that this giant of the faith had strongholds in his life he still dealt with even as you and I do. You ever wondered why it is that you lose a sock when you put it in the laundry and inevitably there is one sock out of the pair that's missing? Anybody ever done that? I circumvent it. I, I put a rubber band around two. If I'm going to lose one, I'm going to lose them both. You know what I mean? I mean, I am, this is, I've even accused my clothes dryer of eating the socks. Have you ever, anybody else ever done that? It's like, come on. Well, apparently, according to a report in USA Today, our sock thief might be of a furry nature instead because they describe a three-year-old Great Dane that had been sick and vomiting, and x-rays showed this dog's stomach had something foreign in it. And so a Portland, Oregon veterinarian performed surgery on the dog, and what Dr. Ashley McGee found were, listen to this, 43 and a half socks in that dog's stomach. Not 44. Even dogs know when they're full, you know what I'm saying? 43 and a half socks. And while we contemplate and ask ourselves, how can a dog do that? We would be wise to look in the mirror at ourselves and ask, why do I often commit the same sin? Why do I display the same dysfunctional behavior over and over again? How many of us have promised God on several occasions, oh boy, I'm not going to do that, and, and then found ourselves later asking forgiveness for the hundredth time because we went ahead and sinned anyway. A stronghold is not an occasional sin. A stronghold is a repeated behavior. It's something that we've done over and over in, an automatic reaction or response. You know how it is sometimes something happens, your spouse says something, you have the same reaction over and over again. It's a predictable choice that Satan uses and reuses and, and convinces us that we have no power to conquer. That's what a stronghold is. And while Satan oftentimes advertises the pleasure of sin, I've never seen him, I've never seen Satan disclose the consequences of our sinful behavior. And, and it can be different for all of us. For some of us, uh, alcohol might be our stronghold, or tobacco, pornography, Facebook. Shopping can be a stronghold. Eating can be a stronghold. Watching television too much, playing video games, gambling can be a stronghold for some. Stealing and whether it's addiction that we wrestle with or it's a, a persistent, plaguing emotion, whether we have 
illegitimate fears that paralyze us from enjoying life, or maybe it's an uncontrolled anger that keeps others from enjoying life. Whether we are acting irresponsibly because of lies that we've been told by someone else, or whether we're acting irresponsibly because of abuse we've suffered in the past, sinful behavior repeated over and over makes us feel like we're forever prisoners in that stronghold. proverb writer said it well, as a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. And so it is that Satan will convince us that our sin is okay. God will understand. It's full of grace, full of love. Satan convinces us that our unchecked emotions and our reactions are justified. After all, that person had it coming. He never shows us the damage that is caused by the strongholds that enslave us. But Scripture reminds us of this. When it is finished, sin always results in death. On the outside, Robin Williams seemed like a happy man who enjoyed making others laugh. He invented so many imaginary characters, and he had different voices that he, for each of those, those personalities, and he could switch from one to the other with amazing speed. I mean, to most of us, he seemed like a happy extrovert, but to those who knew him, they said he was an insecure introvert. Even his closest friends said they, they really didn't know Robin Williams because he was rarely serious. In a book entitled Robin, the actor is portrayed as a deeply complicated, contradictory man who who battled alcohol and and drugs, rampant infidelity, a lifelong loneliness. He, He once called cocaine the devil's dandruff, but he felt powerless to resist it. In an interview with Diane Sawyer, Williams described his addictions, and I'm quoting here, as always there. One moment you think you're fine, and the next moment you wake up in Cleveland wondering how and when you got there. And even though his fans numbered in the millions, Robin Williams couldn't find freedom from those demons within himself. And so on August 11th of 2014, the 63-year-old actor took his own life. Sean Weiss is the actor who played Greg Goldberg, the talkative goalie in the Mighty Ducks movie series in the 1990s. Weiss's life has spun out of control since then. In July of 2017, he was arrested for petty theft and spent 150 days in the L.A. County Jail. Only one month later, he was arrested for possession of methamphetamine and sentenced to 90 days in jail. Weiss was again arrested two weekends ago at the age of 39. Does he look 39? This time for intoxication. Like Robin Williams, Sean Weiss is plagued by many demons he's yet to find freedom from. And you know as well as I do, those stories are repeated over and over and over again. We may know of people who have struggled with those demons. We, we may ourselves have felt hopeless and helpless, addicted to strongholds or unreasonable emotions. Whatever, whatever stronghold it was in Paul's life, he put in words what many of us oftentimes feel The good I want to do, I don't. The bad I don't want to do is what I do. What a miserable man I am. You ever felt that way? And that inward struggle was as real for Paul nearly 2,000 years ago as it is for you and I today. But he wanted us to know there's hope. Which leads us to verse 25, the delight of divine freedom. There's a cataclysmic confusion in our culture today between what are physical 
genetic diseases that require a medical cure from what are toxic behaviors that, that require counseling, a change in the way we think and in the decisions that we make. And, and when we mistakenly assume that every dysfunction, every dysfunction, it seems like in our society, when we mistakenly think it is a medical issue instead of a choice issue, as some do, we miss out on the only opportunity for the cure in those situations. For many of his 30 years, Jesus attended the synagogue services there in, in Nazareth. Nazareth was a small town. I mean, everybody knew everybody else. He had been in the synagogue so many times, they, they knew Jesus, they knew who he was. And at the age of 30, Jesus stands up in this synagogue there in Nazareth to read Scripture, and the scroll of Isaiah was handed to Jesus, and, and he opens it to Isaiah chapter 61 that describes Israel's future Messiah. And Jesus begins to read these words, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, folks, many Jewish men had read those words over the centuries, but this time, it was what happened next that set Jesus apart from all those other Jewish guys. Because Jesus rolled the scroll up, he handed it to the attendant there, and he sat down. And all the eyes were staring at Jesus. Not a word was said until finally Jesus said something that I guess those present missed it today. This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus was declaring, I am the one who has been sent to free the prisoner. I am the one who will bring freedom to those who are oppressed and in bondage. And Matthew and Mark and Luke and John described in their gospel accounts how Jesus went about doing that very thing in the first century. And Jesus Christ has brought physical and spiritual freedom to those in, in bondage for 20 centuries since then. Some would have us believe today there is no cure for the addict. Whatever that addiction might be, that once he or she is an addict, they will always be an addict. That an addict can only stay clean or dry or, or maintain their sobriety throughout their lifetime. Some would have us believe today there is no cure for those who've been abused for those who've been traumatized, that their emotions can only be managed through counseling and medication. And I'm telling you, I understand the Bible says there's a time for everything under heaven. There is a time for counseling, and there's a time for medication, and there's a time for accountability and friendships when it comes to overcoming addiction and abuse and trauma. But listen to me, Jesus Christ did not come to simply help us maintain or manage our sinful strongholds. He came to set us free from them. Jesus Christ is the truth, and when He sets us free, we will be totally, unapologetically, undeniably free from the spiritual and psychological bondage that Satan has enslaved us in. Jesus described himself as the bread from heaven that satisfies the soul. And when Jesus told those who were following him in John chapter 6, they must eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, they, they wrongly assumed he was speaking to them in literal terms. And as a result, some were repulsed and many turned away. And even though Jesus clarified for those who remained that he was he was speaking to them in spiritual terms. Many left. And so Jesus turns to the twelve, and he asks them a very important question. You don't want to leave also, do you?
Mind you, the movement that Jesus had invested three years of his life in, that, that movement, whether it would continue or whether it would die, would be dependent upon the answer that was given to that question. You don't want to leave also, do you? As he so often did, Peter spoke on behalf of the others when he said, Lord, to whom else would we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know over the past three years that you are the Holy One of God. Lord, we are addicted to you. They not only believed that Jesus is the truth, they knew it. You think Jesus' disciples were bored during that three years of following him around? My goodness, it's dusty and, and hot. Think they got bored? Now, before you answer that question, remember, they didn't have cell phones back then with which they could surf the Internet or, or talk or text. They didn't have DVD players as standard equipment on the fishing boats or the donkeys they rode upon. There wasn't any satellite TV in Palestine, no Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Face Chat, Skype. Nevertheless, every day they woke up, man, was a new adventure. Every day was something they would remember the rest of their lives because they were with Jesus. They embraced the one who is the truth. And they not only lived for the truth, they ended up dying for the truth. Because Jesus had a twofold mission to seek and to save the lost, Je the disciples embraced that same mission. They were committed to bringing the lost to Jesus. They would teach the lost to obey what Jesus had taught them to obey. And as Paul would later write to the Colossian Christians, Jesus' disciples knew that real life, real life is found in Jesus Christ. So why is it Paul still had his struggles? And why is it that you and I still have our struggles and, and those chains that, that are wrapped around us? Why is that? Why, why is it we can't seem to get victory over some of these strongholds? Though God views us as clean and forgiven, that moment that we fully surrender, we fully commit our lives to Jesus Christ, the reality is even though he sees us that way through the blood of Jesus, practically speaking, we all have some cleanup we yet need to do. Our minds have been programmed for so long by Satan's lies, it's going to take a while for God to reprogram our minds through the power of His truth and His Holy Spirit. But listen, here's the good news. God promises us this, the good work He began at our conversion, He will ultimately complete when He takes us home. So here's just some practical things that we need to do here to overcome these chains on a daily basis. Number one, we need to admit our faith or our, our, our problem, our fault, and confess our sin. I'm telling you, ever since Adam and Eve, if we can absolve ourselves of any responsibility for anything that's gone wrong, we do, man. We'll point a finger at our spouse. We'll point a finger at our best friend. It's always somebody else's fault. That's the culture that we live in. And the first thing we need to do is to confess that sin. To look at the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror, and say, man, I ain't got nobody else here to point a finger at but me. And confess that sin. And the Bible promises us that God is faithful to forgive us when we do that. Secondly, accountability is the key. You see, Satan would love it if you and I tried to conquer these strongholds on our own. He loves it when we, we silently keep these things to ourselves because after all, if I was to tell somebody what I'm really like, they might not like me, right? 
So I'll just try and do this on my own. And the reality is, Scripture says we need to confess our sins to each other, man. We need accountability from each other. I need to let you know here's an area that I'm struggling with. Keep me accountable to it. And thirdly, we need to focus on the prize. I mean, we get so wrapped up in what's happening and the failures of the the here and the now, and we need to remember, man, we are victorious. This life is going to be over soon enough, and when it is, because of Jesus Christ, we are more than conquerors. And Paul said he he kept his eyes on the goal because he knew that to be true. Mel Trotter became addicted to gambling and alcohol as a teenager. After he got married and had a son, he would frequently promise his wife that he was going to quit drinking, and he would for a little while. And every time he broke his promise, every time he came home drunk, he he hated himself that much more. He would beg and steal for alcohol. He bounced from job to job because of alcohol. And one time, Mel Trotter came home from a 10-day drunk, 10 days of being drunk. And when he got home, found his wife with their two years and one month old son dead in her arms. The only child they had. She made her husband promise on their son's casket that he would quit drinking, and he made the promise to do so. Two hours after the funeral, he was so drunk he couldn't even find his way home. On his way to Lake Michigan, where he was committed to drowning himself, Mel Trotter sold his shoes so that he could buy one last drink. Walking barefoot through the snow, he heard singing in the Pacific Garden Mission, and when he went in, this hopeless drunk found Jesus Christ. For the next 40 years, Mel Trotter devoted himself, his life, to helping those who were as desperate as he had been in finding Jesus Christ. Every person feeling trapped in their addictions or the strongholds of their sinful behavior, every one of them has a name or a spouse or children or parents. And every person deserves to find permanent freedom from their strongholds in Jesus Christ. Think with me for a moment. If we were stranded in a wilderness and we had a choice between a fresh spring of clean water or water that had been sitting stagnant in a pit, in a hole, which would we choose? God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah these words. My people have committed two sins. Number one, they have forsaken me, he said, the spring of living water. And number two, they have dug their own holes in the ground, or cisterns as they were called, that don't even hold water. They're cracked. They're broken. They don't hold water. Why is it we keep trying to fill our souls with things and pursuits and behavior It just doesn't satisfy. It's never going to satisfy. It never has and it never will. So why do we think it's going to be any different? Jesus called himself the living water. And he promised to continually refresh those who would come to him, who would learn from him, who would imitate him. And many have found their souls satisfied by his truth his presence, his peace. So why, why, why do we settle for that which appears to be good when that which is best is so available to us? God has 
promise that he will provide a way of escape out of any stronghold that we have. And this morning, you know and I know that it was Jesus Christ who set us free. And every time that we partake of the communion, we demonstrate to the world the power that Jesus has to set us free from our chains. I'm going to ask, first of all, you've got those little chains, and by now, hopefully, you have an area, a stronghold, an emotion, a sin, a hurt, an abuse that, that's got you chained. You know what's symbolized in that chain, and I'm going to ask if you're ready to, to give that up, to release it, to give it to the Lord that we're going to pass these baskets and, and uh, just put your chain in there. And we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. And there's some here at the front. So if those who are in the front, if you would just start those and get, start passing them in your section around to the back, um, that would be great. And while the praise team is singing, Amazing Grace, my chains are gone. And the communion is passed to you. Now listen to me closely here, because it's different from what we normally do. I want you to hold on to the bread. I want you to hold on to the cup, because we're going to partake of the communion, all of us together here, when the song is over. So as we sing together with them, and as the emblems are passed, please take the bread and the juice and just remain where you're at and hold on to it as we sing it.